We have a question here from Aishwarya Ashtikar from Ahmedabad, India. Aishwarya writes, my question is that the only tool we have to attain or experience the Atman is our mind. And after study, we have come to know that we are not the mind. And Ashtavakra Gita says, you just believe that you are the Atman. So is this all about tricking the mind into believing? Is Advaita Vedanta all about training and tricking the mind? Well, um, let me see. There are a number of issues which uh, Aishwarya has raised here. First of all, my question is that the only tool we have is the mind. Tool to experience, to attain or experience the Atman is the mind. And we have come to know that we are not the mind. All right. And there's absolutely nothing wrong in this. You see, it seems, when you put it this way, it seems a little odd to say that in the mind, through the mind, we will study Vedanta, uh, question who we are, and then we realize we are not the mind. In the mind only, this realization will come that I am not the mind, I am the witness of the mind, the witness consciousness. And this seems odd. But it's not odd, actually. Think about it. As you said, the mind is, the, is an instrument and it does what it is designed to do. For example, um, let's take this as a nice example. When Suppose I say, I am happy. So now what exactly said I am happy? It is the tongue. It is the apparatus of the voice, the voice box with the help of the lungs and all. So the tongue said, I am happy. But it's not that the, the tongue is happy. It is the mind where there is happiness. It is the mind which is expressing happiness using the tongue. And there is nothing wrong in the tongue saying, I am happy, when uh, the tongue is actually not happy. It's expressing a feeling of happiness which is in the mind. And actually, it's not even the mind. Uh, it, is the, uh, it is I, the jiva, I, the consciousness, uh, in, uh, through the mind, uh, witnessing having a first-person experience of happiness in the mind. And then uh, that is being expressed through another instrument that is the organ of speech. Similarly, the mind is an instrument. It is the organ of knowledge. And uh, when enlightenment comes and ignorance goes, we will realize that I am Brahman. His mind is not Brahman, but the realization requires the mind. So, just like the tongue is an instrument and can express the happiness which does not belong to the tongue, it belongs to the mind. Similarly, the mind can express the knowledge that um, Shivoham or Aham Brahmasmi, though the mind, of course, is not uh, Brahman. There is a principle of knowledge that uh, knowledge removes ignorance when they have the same uh, Ashraya and Vishaya. Ashraya means locus, Vishaya means object. Let me explain that. It's a very simple principle, actually. Um, when knowledge has to remove ignorance, uh, it, it, the question is, where is that ignorance and what is it about? So if I'm ignorant about Sanskrit, suppose, then the knowledge that I require will be knowledge of Sanskrit, not any other knowledge. Knowledge of German will not remove my ignorance of uh, Sanskrit. Similarly, if I'm ignorant about my own self, the Atman, then the knowledge I require is the knowledge of the Atman. That is clear. But another point is the Ashraya, the locus. Where will the knowledge come? My knowledge, my ignorance about the Atman or about Sanskrit will not be removed by my teacher's uh, knowledge of Sanskrit or my teacher's enlightenment. Suppose I have an enlightened master, but the enlightenment of the teacher is not enough to remove my ignorance. The knowledge, the enlightenment must come in the mind where ignorance is. In my mind, there is ignorance, so the knowledge must come in the mind. Further details of this you can find at the end of Vedanta Sara, for example. How exactly does enlightenment take place? This is something called Akhandakara Vritti or Brahmakara Vritti. And it has two components, which is Vritti Vyapti and Phalab Vyapti. What is Vritti Vyapti? What is Phalab Vyapti? I will not go into here. In the end of Vedanta Sara, you will find a detailed explanation of exactly what happens at enlightenment and what is the role of the mind. What the mind can do and has to do. That is the essential role of the mind. And what it is that the mind cannot do. 
Why is it that we say that um, Brahman, Atman is beyond the mind and uh, the mind cannot reach it? And at the same time, we say, Manasei Vedam Aktabhyam. It is only by the mind that you can um, attain uh, Brahma Jnana. Uh, the Atman is beyond the mind and it is only through the mind that you can attain the Atman. How do you reconcile these two apparently contradictory statements that you will find nicely discussed at the end of Vedanta Sara? So, um, let me see, is there any other issue? Is this all about tricking the mind into believing? Ashtavakra Gita says you just believe that you are the Atman. No, actually, I know what you are referring to. Ashtavakra Gita, it says, Shraddhasvatata, Shraddhasva, Matra, Moham, Kurushvabho. Uh, you are Atman. Have faith, my child. Do not be deluded on this point. Yes, straightforward affirmation, faith, that can enable uh, enlightenment. But that's not the primary thing which Ashtavakra says. The whole of Ashtavakra is an inquiry into who we are and direct realization of who we are. Believing that you realize that you are the Atman by having Shraddha, that is a powerful suggestion given by Ashtavakra. But that's not mainstream. Uh, the, the mainstream Vedantic uh, process is to inquire and realize. Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. Is it to, is all about training and tricking the mind? Is it about training the mind? Certainly, training of the mind is, uh, is foundational for Advaita Vedanta. Mind must be purified and must be trained to focus and must be trained in Vedantic thought. Um, karma yoga for chitta shuddhi, purification of mind is necessary. Um, yoga, yogic meditation for concentration of mind, ekagrata is necessary. And then, shravana manana nididhyasana, jnana yoga. Jnana yoga consists of the hearing, the reflection, and uh, Vedantic meditation. Uh, that, that is necessary for the arising of the Brahmakara Vritti, the enlightening flash of knowledge which removes ignorance. So that training of the mind, of course, is necessary. Um, is it about tricking the mind? No, it's not tricking, not in the negative sense of, of a trick. But there is a point to it. Um, I sometimes use the word tricking, uh, sometimes you see this in some meditation techniques used in um, the dharanas which you find in Vigyana, Bhairava, in Kashmiri Shaivism. It's a kind of a trick. Trick only in this sense that the mind's natural tendency is to flow outwards. The Kato Upanishad says, Param chikhani vyatrinat swayambhu tasmat parang pasyati nantar atman. The mind flows outwards. Our senses move outwards to their objects and the mind flows along with that. So we experience external things and we are constantly concerned with external uh, objects. We see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Uh, we think about all that, all those things, uh, all those external entities. Um, we are ever concerned with the world or with the body or with thoughts in the mind. And that's all external. That is all vishaya for consciousness. But we do not turn inwards to, uh, to appreciate, to, to notice to realize that we are awareness. It is to awareness that all of these are being uh, revealed. So, trick may not be the right word, but you need a certain amount of subverting the normal flow of the mind, the outward flow of the mind. So, uh, inwardization, a certain amount of turning the mind inwards uh, is necessary. I hope that answers your question. And so now we have another question from Sri Vidya, New Jersey. She writes, Namaskar and Swamiji, my question is, some of us are unable to be in the path of Vedantic inquiry due to heavy bhakti samskaras. We find ourselves back on the bhakti path even when we practice inquiry. Will constant practice of bhakti lead to Vedantic self-realization? If our objective is realization of Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya, and if we are a bhakti practitioner, what could be some of the tools or tips to remember so we steer our bhakti practices in Advaita Vedanta direction? Um, first of all, why would you want to steer your bhakti practices in Advaita Vedanta direction? What I mean by that is, uh, Sri Ramakrishna, if you ask this question to Sri Ramakrishna, he would straight away tell you it is enough. If you are lucky enough to have deep devotion to God, a bhakti samskara, a natural pull towards the Lord, it is the same reality. 
Sri Ramakrishna says, imagine a uh, boundless ocean of water that is like Satchidaran, the existence uh, consciousness place, like an ocean. In that water, due to the cool devotion, the coolness uh, uh, generated by the devotion of the uh, bhakta, um, so water freezes in different forms in some places. And that becomes the particular form and name uh, of the divine or the qualities of the divine. It could be formless, uh, but it, it has qualities. So God with qualities, a personal God with qualities, with qualities, with name, with form, nama, rupa, and guna, saguna, brahmana, ishvara. That is the God of religion. And with that God of religion, we have a relationship of bhakti. Now, Sri Ramakrishna's example, you notice, that this god of religion, the iceberg, has exactly the same nature as the water. It has a temporary name and form uh, imposed on it. That is how we worship God. Uh, but otherwise, it's exactly the same reality. It's not a lower grade of reality. It's not a lower grade of Brahman. So from Sri Ramakrishna's perspective, what you are approaching through jnana is exactly the same reality that you are approaching through bhakti. Uh, it's the same uh, ontologically speaking, the same reality. So, if you have a deep devotional tendency, he doesn't. He will tell you, tell you that don't bother about steering the bhakti in an advaitic direction. Now, suppose I want to realize, as she has written, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Then what do I do? Uh, but I am basically deeply devoted to God. Again, Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna says, what the Vedanta says, my mother has shown me. So we can pray to the Lord. You're, you're deeply devoted to God. You can pray to the Lord. Uh, please show me the truth that Brahman is real and the world is an appearance. And uh, God will show you. Is it possible? Certainly it is possible. It has happened again and again. And Ishwara can give us that, uh, that knowledge. Even a strict Advaitin, a classical Advaitin, will not see anything wrong in this. Uh, you know, a strict Advaitin might say that, Oh, you have to study Vedanta and do Shravana Manana Nididhyasana, a Vedantic text systematically, and then only you will realize. Fine, you are already doing that, Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. But what will happen through deep devotion, the purity of mind, the concentration of mind generated by a long devotional practice, where you actually begin to feel the presence of Ishwara, of the personal God, Bhagavan, that kind of mind even with a little bit of Shravana Manana Nididhyasana, it will be easier for that mind to grasp the Advaitic truth than for an unpurified, unfocused mind, uh, which does not have much bhakti, but is constantly engaged in uh, trying to reason and trying to read this book or that book and listen to this lecture or that lecture. That mind might, that mind might find it much more difficult to get Advaitic realization than the bhakta's mind. As Swami Vivekananda said, uh, an ounce of practice is worth 20 tons of tall talk. So if I have 20 tons of tall Advaitic talk and you have an ounce of bhakti, actually in spiritual life, you may be further along the road than I am. All right. Thank you so much.